wonderful to be back in Bodrum. Wonderful to have a speaking part again. Doesn't include saying I do this year. But uh, inside joke for those who were here last year. This is a wonderful event, and I, again, want to thank uh, Hans and Gulchen uh, for their wonderful hospitality. I've uh, put on a few conferences in my career. I know how difficult it is, and I can't imagine doing that and playing travel agent and uh, uh, room and board and three squares a day uh, for three days like this in this wonderful location. So uh, we just can't give these guys enough thanks, enough round of applause. So. Please, for Hans. As Hans mentioned, uh, I was uh, tasked with the uh, same topic of uh, what do bankers know and don't know. And it was such a, a quick answer for me of uh, nothing uh, <laughs> that I had to I had to tweak this a little bit. So it's, it's more like what do bankers do and don't do. And I thought that uh, for a crowd like this, it'd be very appropriate to uh, quote uh, that famous uh, economist that we all revere, uh, John Maynard Keynes. And Keynes said, a sound banker, alas, is not one who foresees danger and avoids it, but one who, when he is ruined, is ruined in a conventional way along with his fellows, so that no one can really blame him. Uh, and for those who know my past, I uh, somehow uh, take uh, some of that to heart. Uh, I, I'm going to tell this story by talking about a couple of books. One's an older book that uh, you'd have a hard time finding, and one is a brand new book uh, to tell the story of bankers. and and uh, what they do and what they don't do. And uh, the first one is a, a book called Dead Bank Walking, which I think is probably the best title of any book about banking. It was written by Robert Smith, who was the president of Security Pacific Bank in uh, California. And it was a big California bank and had the goal of being, quote, a diversified financial services company with a worldwide presence, the monetary equivalent of McDonald's, but the brand name prestige of Saks Fifth Avenue. And grow the bank, they did. They grew the bank through acquisitions. Um, during the 1980s, Security Pacific bought big banks in Northern California, in Arizona, in Oregon, in Washington, and they did buy the third largest bank in Nevada, this little bank called Nevada National Bank. And I happened to, uh, happened to work at Nevada National Bank, so eventually I worked for Security Pacific. And the best money that Security Pacific ever spent uh, was paying for my master's degree uh, at UNLV, where I ran into Murray Rothbard and, of course, Hans Hoppe. So I'm sure they feel the same way uh, <laughs> about this expenditure. But Smith tells his story. He, says, uh, he said, during this time, and I think he's talking about the late 80s here, uh, late 80s uh, leading up to uh, the California real estate crash. But he says, during this time, the cockiness of bankers, security Pacific bankers in particular, was leviathan in scope. And the queasy extravagance of the time was epitomized by the American Bankers Association conventions. These were elaborate brag fests of leisure and self-congratulation, a high-class Mardi Gras for financiers. These events were exhilarating with promise and blind to the inevitable eventuality of economic downturn. Now his credit officer, a guy named Bob Cordaway, was at the time skeptical and discussion about how great the prospects were for Security Pacific among senior managers. He said, it's rather natural that when things are going well and everyone is comfortable, there is a tendency for an individual, an institution, and even an entire industry to become somewhat self-pleased. But the wind was at the back at Security Pacific. Cordaway's warnings were not heeded. And they, the Security Pacific funded everything. They funded leveraged buyouts, massive real estate deals. They even made a $10 million loan 
unsecured to a guy named Donald Trump. Security Pacific would write that entire $10 million loan off two years later, and if the rumors were true that I heard when I was at the bank, Donald Trump never made a payment. They also funded Hawaiian, the construction of Hawaiian resorts, and they made a loan to Peter Uberoff, who may, some of you may remember was the commissioner of baseball, uh, but he had the dream of taking over Hawaiian Airlines, and uh, Security Pacific made that loan, and uh, it didn't work out well. In fact, none of these loans worked out very well. But in 1990, things were still going well. The bank uh, had record earnings of 740 million, but it was at that point that everything fell apart. California real estate cratered, and this ag aggressive real estate lending that Security Pacific had engaged in uh, had caught up with them. And the next thing you know, one of Bob Smith's senior managers, a guy named Nick Binkley, is telling him, he says, quote, Bob, we must not fight this thing to death. It's painful business, but we've got to sell our horse before it dies. And at that point, here's a guy, uh, Bob Smith, who had five trustees on his house, personally, to securing loans to buy Security Pacific stock. So this is certainly a guy who believed in his business, uh, had indebted himself to, uh, to the tune of $5 million on his house, buying stock, and also investing himself in California real estate, unsuccessfully, I might add. Well, at the end of 1990, from the end of 1990 to April 2nd, 1992, when Security Pacific was purchased by Bank of America, the bank's capital fell from $4.71 billion to $1.6 billion. Amazingly, though, Security Pacific was able to get Bank of America to pay them five and a quarter billion dollars for that 1.6 billion. In other words, they pay, paid 3.25 times book. And that is a rich price to book in any sort of environment, especially when a bank is going downhill that quickly. So shareholders, SB shareholders, uh, received the equivalent of $41 for each one of their shares. Smith estimates in his book that without the buyout, the shares probably would have went for $4 on their way to zero when the bank probably would have failed. So he was able to sell his horse before it died. Now, the next bank I wanted to talk about and the next book I wanted to talk about, Joe uh, Salerno talked about WAMU this morning, Washington Mutual. And there's a wonderful book out by a woman named Kirsten Grind. Uh, her book is called The Lost Bank. And WAMU had started out as a good-sized Washington State um, savings and loan, and they would grow into one of the largest banks in the country. And started in the 1990s when subprime lending actually got very, very hot at that time. Number of lenders tripled. Uh, to more than 2,000 lenders in 1997. And WAMU wanted to be a player. They wanted to increase their market share in subprime lending. So the president at the time was a guy named Kerry Killinger, and he announced that he wanted his company to have 20% of the mortgage market. That was four times the mortgage market that they had in 2000. His new advertising campaign in 2001, I don't know if any of you remember it for those uh, in the US, it was called The Power of Yes. WAMU can make getting a mortgage easier, said the commercials, and they actually had the commercials debut during the Academy Awards. That is expensive time to be buying. Now the Home Division's annual sales meeting uh, where they grew uh, or they drew their um, sales consultant for mortgages. It was held in Atlanta that year. Uh, they had a large convention hall. It was decorated as a huge revival tent, which would be appropriate in Atlanta. They had a gospel choir shipped in from LA to sing between speeches. 
They even had an evangelist in a white suit work in the crowd of 1,500 WAMU representatives in a frenzy uh, shouting, WAMU HULA, instead of hallelujah. It was WAMU HULA. And the company tripled the number of mortgages they did between 2000 and 2001. WAMU salespeople made double or triple, by the way, on subprime mortgages what they made on prime mortgages. So it only makes economic sense that those were the type of loans that they were chasing. And Wall Street, by the way, couldn't buy enough of these. Mortgage-backed securities market sur uh, sur uh, surpassed $1.8 trillion in 2002, and that had been a 200% increase in the last two years. And WAMU earned a lot of money. They earned $1.8 billion selling its mortgages. They were so good that American Banker magazine named Killinger the Banker of the Year in 2001. One Wall Street analyst called him the Alexander the Great of the thrift business. His credibility on Wall Street is unquestioned, said another. But he was an interesting character. Um, uh, Ms. Ms. Grind writes that executives had learned long ago that the best way to bring Killinger an issue was one-on-one. -on -one. Otherwise, he avoided confrontation. He would ignore emails, he would avoid phone calls until a problem resolved itself on its own. No. three, uh, Killinger compared WAMU's growth and plans to category killers like, Sear, or like Walmart, Starbucks, Costco and Home Depot. Company earned a billion dollars for the first time. It had 3,000 branches and ATMs. It had 50,000 employees. Stock hit $45 a share. Things uh, couldn't be going better. Killinger, well, he had divorced his wife, found a new wife, started dyeing his hair, spiffed up his wardrobe, worked out constantly. He was a guy that used to only fly commercial. Suddenly, he would only fly private. And he spent all his time flying across the country having brand name rallies. These were three hour productions to pump up the troops, to inspire selling, and the selling of what? Mortgages. The, compensated, the compensation kept rolling in for Killinger. Uh, he and his new wife bought a couple houses, they bought a new boat, uh, they removed the WAMU headquarters into a $300 million uh, skyscraper in downtown Seattle. Had complete, uh, the dining room was buffet style, outdoor garden where employees could walk around and enjoy themselves. Killinger was obsessed with WAMU being a growth company. He wanted the bank to grow at 10% a year, what the economic environment was. He wanted the bank to be 500 billion by 2009. He planned to grow the bank 250 branches a year. And Wall Street was pushing him all this time. And he responded most uh, to Wall Street's urgings because he cared about the stock price and he cared about earnings. So in 2004, he developed a new five-year plan. Killinger, by the way, was continually doing five-year plans. It almost sounds like the Soviet Union back in the day. But this one called for a higher risk lending strategy. He consciously, at that point in 2004, wanted to have more option arms and more home equity loans, arguably the riskiest mortgage loans you can make. However, what really drove Killinger and probably a number, of their, uh, a number of other bankers out there, is that he wanted to beat his nearest competition, which was Countrywide. Countrywide was the big dog of, of lenders, and he, any, he actually had tried to buy Angelo Mazzillo's firm, couldn't make the deal happen, so whatever Countrywide did, uh, WAMU tried to do it better. At the time, uh, uh, a loan underwriter for Washington Mutual actually was interviewed by the, uh, the New York Times, and the, the underwriter said, I swear 60% of the loans I approved, I was made to. And what he, what he or she was meant by that was that 
they were, he was made to uh, by senior management. No matter what the local underwriters were doing, senior management wanted the loans approved. Now meanwhile, WAMU was doing training seminars that didn't have anything to do with credit underwriting. And this is what happens when banks are in growth mode. And they want loans, they don't care about credit underwriting. Instead, managers were required to read the book, Who Moved My Cheese? <laughs> and prepare book reports. The company actually hired a blues band to write songs to help new employees adjust to the WAMU culture. If they weren't getting along well. Now, Killinger, he expressed some concerns about the housing bubble in an email to his risk manager, but, you know, it was just a passing thought, and WAMU pressed on. I mean, Killinger was concerned about the company's earnings, he was concerned about the stock price, and besides, at the time, Walter, uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke had dismissed the notion uh, completely that there could ever be any sort of nationwide housing bubble. You, the end of 2005, uh, nearly half of WAMU's $7 billion in option arms were negatively amortizing. And what that means is, is that people weren't paying enough on their payments to completely pay, pay the interest, so the interest was being added to the principal. Now, because of account, accounting standards, um, they could actually, WAMU could actually count these as interest income. So in other words, WAMU customers had avoided, through these option arms, paying 316 million in interest, but WAMU was able to book that 316 million in interest as if they had paid it because of accounting standards. So the top producing mortgage consultants were treated uh, to what was known as the President's Club, events, they were held in Hawaii, they were held in Cancun. These were uh, full weekend affairs, nonstop, partying, all expenses paid, and uh, the uh, top producers were treated as rock stars. But the theme of these, the, uh, these uh, conventions, if you will, was that all of WAMU's corporate structure worked in sales, and it was working. 2005, WAMU made three and a half billion dollars in profit. But something happened in 06. Something happened that hadn't happened in the United States in a long time. And that was the median price of homes nationwide declined. And also the number of home sales fell. But Killinger at the time told his employees at a company pep rally, I don't think there's a single institution in this country that is as well positioned as Washington Mutual is. So he wasn't interested in 2007 when one of his senior lieutenants came to him and said, Kerry, for the sake of a lot of people who stayed here and have been loyal to you, you need to sell out. You need to get out while you can get something for this bank. Well, as a concern for subprime mortgages permeated Wall Street, Killinger wasn't interested in selling out. In fact, he actually wanted to buy AmeriQuest Mortgage. The deal never worked out, but if it had, he would have had billions more in subprime mortgages come into his operation. And it was about this time that WAMU's bad loans jumped 45%. By June of 07, the bank held $1.7 billion in subprime loans, another $750 million in foreclosed real estate, and a year later, he had $5.5 billion in uh, bad loans. The default rates on the securities that WAMU assembled during 2006 and 2007 as these loans were wrapped into collateralized debt obligations to sell in the secondary market, the default rates ran as high as 42%, the loss rates ran as high as 65%, but this was despite the fact that the rating agencies rated these securities AAA. But Killinger kept the sunny side up. He told an audience at an investor conference, this frankly may be the best times we've ever seen for making new loans in our portfolio. Killinger was still uh, living the high life. 
He had met uh, Bernanke, he met Greenspan, he even attended Davos a couple years, he made, uh, made 21 million in 06, 07 he made 11 million as the market was collapsing. But at the time when the market was melting down, no one could figure out why Killinger didn't revert to crisis mode. In fact, he didn't revert to any mode at all, he couldn't make a decision, he was paralyzed. So the executive team had to start going to the number two man for any sort of decisions. Now it was at this point that the Office of Thrift Supervision, which was the primary regulator for, for WAMU, um, they cut the CAMEL rating, which is an internal regulation, uh, re uh, regulator rating that, uh, for financial institutions, from a sa satisfactory rating of two down to an unsatisfactory rating of three. Uh, when one of the team reported that uh, the OTS was going to do that, um, Killinger said, I don't like to hear bad news. And he walked out of the room. <laughs> the fourth quarter of 07, the bank lost 1.9 billion. In the first quarter of 08, it lost a billion. The stock price plunged 70%. But uh, at the 08 shareholders meeting, a gaunt, shaken Killinger told 2,500 attendees, Today, I believe that we are at the beginning of the road back, the return to profitability. But after a steady stream of shareholders blasting him from the, the microphone, uh, the one-time banker of the year was a little shaken up. And he said, I just want people to calm down, have a little faith. But uh, as Joe Salerno uh, uh, talked about this morning, faith is no match for a bank run. Um, in June of 08, uh, Chuck Schumer, if you remember, uh, uh, probably one of the loath most loathsome senators in, uh, in the United States Senate from New York, he sent a letter to regulators expressing concern about another big uh, SNL, and that was IndyMac. Uh, IndyMac uh, had a, a run on their deposits when the press reeked, uh, leaked this letter. Uh, that Schumer had sent uh, expressing concern about him, and they lost 1.3 billion or 7% of their deposits. Well, that illustrates to you fractionalized bank, I mean, fractionalized banking is it doesn't take much of a percentage of deposits to close down a bank. With uh, IndyMac, it was 7% of their deposits. And it picks up steam. As one bank has a run uh, on, on them, then it will go to another bank. And in this case, it went to WAMU. In the three days after IndyMac was closed, WAMU lost a billion five in deposits. On the fourth day, they lost a billion eight. And after two weeks, they had lost $9.4 billion in deposits. That was 6% of their total deposit base. And it was at this point that the regulators started circulate, uh, uh, circling WAMU. Of course, uh, the OTS uh, was their primary regulator, but the en entity that was insuring the deposits of WAMU was the FDIC. And the FDIC was fed up with the OTS's super supervising of, uh, of WAMU. The head of the OTC uh, was a guy named uh, Frank Rich, and the head of the FDIC was a woman named Sheila Bear. They didn't like each other, they didn't get along like most uh, government regulators. They don't want to have anything to do with one another. And there's turf battles throughout. Actually, the FDIC had been trying to get involved in, in regulating and supervising WAMU uh, way back to 2006, and the OTS had con continually objected to them trying to interfere. At this point, it, the OTS was wanting uh, WAMU to give, give WAMU time to work out their own problems. The FDIC was planning for their failure. And the potential buyers for WAMU were few and far between. The only name that continually surfaced was J.P. Morgan. Jamie Dimon's bank had approached uh, Killinger a couple of times to buy him and uh, Killinger had always given him the uh, cold shoulder. And by the way, remember, Jamie Dimon is very politically connected. Harry Killinger was not. And by the way, you have another regulator involved. 
The OCC is the, uh, the regulator that, uh, that oversees J.P. Morgan. So Morgan started talking to the FDIC and the OCC about buying uh, WAMU, leaving the primary regulator, the OTS, out of, uh, out of the conversation, which made Frank Rich at the OTS uh, very unhappy. Now, Diamond ended up making a bid for WAMU. It was low at $5 a share, at least the guys at WAMU thought it was low. Uh, there was a provision in it that he might pay another $3 a share if the home equity portfolio performed better than expected, but WAMU was insulted. And instead, they were able to get $7.2 billion investment from a uh, equity fund called TPG. And politically, the OTS wanted, uh, wanted WAMU to survive, and at the same time, the FDIC wanted WAMU uh, to survive in some way, or at least not take a loss, because the, the uh, uh, insurance fund could not take the hit that a uh, WAMU failure would create. So, uh, and, and it was at this point that uh, Killinger, who had been Banker of the Year a few years ago, was suddenly called by uh, Jim Cramer uh, on Mad Money, one of the worst CEOs in the world. In fact, uh, Cramer put the WAMU Board of Directors on his wall, a wall of shame. Um, these were desperate times. WAMU stocks was trading at $3 a share. Uh, Killinger called Treasury Secretary Paulson. If you remember at the time, um, this would have been in late 08. Uh, they had stopped uh, uh, short selling on financial institution stock, 19 uh, shares in, uh, of uh, financial institutions. Uh, you couldn't short sell them. WAMU was not included in that 19, and they wanted to try to become, uh, have that same protection. But uh, Paulson told him he should, uh, he refused to include uh, WAMU. And in fact, Paulson said, you should have sold out to JP Morgan and you should, you should do so now. And uh, Paulson told Killinger, things could get a lot more difficult for you. Well, he wasn't kidding. The FDIC and the OTC were now doing battle over WAMU every day. Um, Remember, the OTS thought WAMU had a camel rated three. The FDIC thought uh, uh, WAMU was a, should be rated a four, which is essentially just this side of being a failure. And uh, it was at that point that WAMU uh, or the FDIC started shopping around, making phone calls to see who would buy WAMU if they failed. At that point, Killinger is fired. Finally, our Banker of the Year is fired. Uh, a guy named Alan Fishman is take, he takes over. Fishman, is the first thing he does when he gets on the job, he calls Sheila Bear at the FDIC, who tells him, you're okay, I checked you out, but adds, I hate this thing, sell your bank. And uh, at that point, the stock had uh, dipped to $2 a share, and another run on the deposits uh, started. And uh, the J.P. Morgan team started uh, taking a look at um, uh, what a government-assisted failed bank uh, a bid might look at if they were going to look at WAMU. And the, at this point, uh, this is the point when Lehman Brothers fail. Two days later, AIG is bailed out or in other words, Goldman Sachs was bailed out, uh, the WAMU run intensified again. And at that point, Bear called up, Sheila Bear at the FDIC called up uh, Jamie Dimon and asked if J.P. Morgan would buy the failed WAMU uh, in a way that wouldn't cost the FDIC any money. And he said, maybe. And uh, hoping that uh, an increase in the deposit insurance would, uh, would save the bank, Fishman was trying to get the FDIC to raise it from $100,000 to $200,000, thinking that would stem the bank run that was going on. 
they didn't do it at that point, but uh, eventually, of course, they did. They did raise uh, deposit insurance um, later on to 250,000, and actually, in the case of uh, non-interest bearing deposits, to unlimited. Uh, but that uh, they didn't do it in time uh, to uh, to help WAMU. At that point, uh, Brinks trucks were restocking the ATMs at WAMU to the tune of $250 million a day. Uh, $30 million was the normal. So over eight times uh, the amount of cash was being drawn out of uh, WAMU uh, ATMs during this crisis. At that point, uh, Paulson announced TARP, uh, the FDIC seeks uh, bids for the failed WAMU, and JP Morgan is the only bidder. 1.888 billion. Why did they bid 1.888 billion? Lucky Chinese numbers. The number eight is lucky. <laughs> FDIC close, uh, approves closing the bank. That's the theoretical so thought process behind uh, thought used by bankers. Lucky numbers. Uh, FDIC approves closing the bank and selling it to JP Morgan. And on September 25th, 2008, JP Morgan uh, seized the bank. The shareholders, the bondholders were wiped out. JP Morgan took over. A month later, JP Morgan accepts $25 billion in TARP money from the United States Treasury. Three years later, Time Magazine names Jamie Diamond as one of the world's most influential people. In fact, uh, in her new book, Sheila Bear uh, writes that uh, Diamond was a, tower, a towering figure in height as well as leadership ability and described him as the smartest executive in the room. Well, perhaps, but Jamie hasn't retired to be secretary treasurer yet. And after all, <laughs> And after all, his bank has derivatives exposure of over $70 trillion. So I would contend that there are accidents that could happen. In fact, he did have an accident happen in London that I believe is still ongoing of a few billion dollars. So ambitious bankers think they're operating a, a business like any other. When demand is high, you just provide more supply and you grow your franchise. But fractionalized commercial banking is not like selling coffee. It is not like selling garden tools or designer clothes. The power and force and gov of government privilege is required for banks to stay in business in the long term, no matter how successful they are in the short term. Recently, FDIC board member Thomas Honing, he actually made this point in a speech to the Exchequer Club said, in several recent television commercials, one large bank, he's referring to Citibank, is advertising its celebration of 200 years in business. I congratulate them, he said, but it is well documented that this bank has received U.S. government support four times in the last 100 years. He, said, he went on to say, we have slowly, perhaps unintentionally, expanded the safety net and its subs subsidy beyond what is justified to serve the long-term interests of the, of the economy. What started out as a means to approve stability of the payments system and intermediation process, both vital in our economy, has become a tool of leverage, subsidized expansion into activities that has led to greater instability. So, like Keynes said, Bankers should run their banks to ruin in the conventional way, because there's really no other choice. But I would add, bankers, always remember to sell your horse before it dies. Thank you.